Hello and welcome to Chapter 5. Today we're going to start looking at Section 5.1, which deals with using the fundamental identities. Now back in Chapter 4, we looked at the basic definitions, properties, graphs, and applications of some individual trig functions. In Chapter 5, we're going to actually look at how to use these fundamental identities to evaluate trig functions, simplify trig expressions, develop additional trig identities, and then to solve trig equations as well. Think about all the fun we're going to have. Now this table right here is in your book. It's on page 374 if you're having a hard time seeing it here on the screen. You don't have to sit here and write everything down in your notes. A lot of these I'm hoping that you already do know. You should know that sine is um, equivalent to the reciprocal of 1 over cosecant. Cosecant is equal to the reciprocal of 1 over secant. Tangent is the reciprocal of 1 over cotangent. Likewise, cosecant is 1 over sine, secant is 1 over cosine, and cotangent is 1 over tangent. So these right here we studied back in chapter 4. You also should hopefully know by now because it's going to become extremely important that you know that tangent is really sine divided by cosine and cotangent is really cosine divided by sine. Pythagorean identities are also really, really important. Sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1, and 1 plus tan squared equals secant squared. These right here are going to help you out tremendously. Now these, when you look at these two, these are actually, they're very similar. So I personally will memorize this one and know that I can get this one from this one. Because I have 1 plus tan squared equals secant squared, and then this one here is kind of like what's left. It's 1 plus cotangent squared equals cosecant squared. Then we have our co-function identities. And essentially what this means is if I take the sine of pi over 2 minus u, I'm going to get the cosine function. Likewise, if I take the cosine of pi over 2 and I subtract some value of u from it, I'm going to end up with this sine function. Okay, and that's going to kind of hold true for the remaining functions. Then... We have even and odd identities, and remember, an even identity means you can plug a negative number into it and get an even number or a positive number out. And think of like x squared. If I plug a negative number in for x squared, I'm going to get a positive number out, and that is an even function. If I plug a negative number into x cubed, I'm going to get a negative number out, so that would mean it's an odd function. And really, our only even functions are going to be the cosine, which you'll see right here. So cosine and secant are the only two even functions that we've got when dealing with sine, cosine, or our trig functions. And from this point forward, we're just going to go through a series of examples. And uh, if you have questions, please make sure to write them down, and I will be more than happy to go over those in class with you. Example 1 says, to use the values sine x equals 1 half and cosine x is greater than 0 to find the values of all six trig functions. And you're going to notice I'm going to start doing this quite a bit. I'm actually going to sketch a quadrant, and you could do a circle if you want, but I need to kind of do a visual. This right here is telling me I need to have positive cosine values. So what that tells me then is I'm going to be dealing with something that is in the first quadrant and the fourth quadrant because this is where cosine is positive. Now I have a sine x value is equal to a positive number. Well, out of these two quadrants right here, the only one of those quadrants that has a positive sine value is going to be quadrant 1. So I know that I'm going to be dealing with something within this quadrant here. And I'm given that the sine of x is equal to 1 half so if I know sine x equals 1 half, I also know that cosecant x is equal to 2. And if I sketch a right triangle off to the side here, I'm going to call this my x. And I know that I have opposite, which is going to be 1, over my hypotenuse, which is 2. That's going to allow me to solve for the third side, which is with the square root over top of it. 
So now when I go to do my cosine of x, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, which is the square root of 3 over 2. And I know then that secant of x is the reciprocal of cosine. So that's going to give me 2 divided by the square root of 3. And if I rationalize that, I'm going to get 2 square roots of 3 over 3. Then I can do tangent. Tangent of x is going to be equal to the opposite over the reciprocal, or, I'm sorry, opposite over adjacent. So I end up with 1 divided by the square root of 3. And if I rationalize that, I end up with a square root of 3 over 3. And I can find, because I have tangent, I can then go and find cotangent of x. And that's going to give me 3 divided by the square root of 3. And when I rationalize that, I end up with 3 square roots of 3 divided by 3. My 3's are going to cancel, and I'm left with the square root of 3. So now, just by give, being given one trig function and being narrowed down to one quadrant, I'm able to find the other six trig functions. For example, 2, I'm told that I have to simplify the cosine squared of x times the cosecant of x minus the cosecant of x. Now just to kind of think about this on a different level, because I'm thinking you're probably looking at this and have no clue where to start. If I give you something like y squared times x minus x, and I told you to simplify that, I would hope that most of you would realize that you have an x in both of those. So you could factor an x out, and then you would be left with y minus 1. Well, we're going to kind of do the similar process here. Except instead of factoring an x out, I'm really going to be factoring a cosecant out because I have a cosecant in both of these. So if I factor a cosecant out, so if I factor that out, I'm left with cosine squared of x minus 1. And any time I see a cosine squared and a 1 or a sine squared and a 1, I'm automatically going to start to think I should be able to use sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. So let's look at that over here. If I have sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1, and I want to rearrange that so that I get cosine squared, and I'm going to subtract 1, that means I need to get rid of the sine squared, so that's going to give me a negative sine squared. So I can rewrite this as the cosecant, oops, the cosecant of x times a negative sine squared of x. And cosecant is really 1 divided by the sine of x. And I'm multiplying that by a negative, which I'm going to pull the negative out up front, sine squared of x. And what's going to happen then is a sine squared is going to cancel out here and one from here because this is really over one. So then I'm going to be left with a negative sine x. And that is as far as I can simplify this. Next, we have example three. And example three is telling us to factor. And we should have an x right there. And if we factor this, I hope you notice that you have a perfect square here, a perfect square here, and they're being separated by a subtraction or a difference. So I have the difference of two perfect squares, which tells me that I can write this as 1 minus the cosine of x and 1 plus the cosine of x. Part B is going to be very similar to part A. And if it helps you, you can rewrite this as like a different, use a variable for the cosecant. So if I had 2t squared minus 7t plus 6, and, you told, and I told you to factor this, I'm pretty sure you could do this. You would sit there and hopefully tell me that you got 2t minus 3 and t minus 2. 
So if you can do that, then you can do the cosecant stuff, except we're going to have 2 times a cosecant of x minus 3 times the cosecant of x minus 2, and just do a quick double check. You have, If you were to FOIL this out, you'd get 2 cosecant squared. This is going to give us a negative 4 cosecant squared minus 3, which gives us our negative 7 cosecant, and negative 3 and negative 2 will give me my positive 6. So this here would be our final factors. Example 4 says to factor secant squared x plus 3 times the tangent of x plus 1. Now the key to factoring something like this is we always want to rewrite our terms so that we have one trig function. So if you look at secant squared and tangent x, hopefully you remembered the Pythagorean identity that 1 plus tan squared equals secant squared, and this makes this an easy substitution then. So I can rewrite this as 1 plus tan squared of x plus 3 tan x plus 1. And then if I drop my parentheses because everything is being added, I have 1 plus tan squared x plus 3 tan x plus 1, and I have two like terms here, so I'm going to simplify this again. So I have tan squared x plus 3 tan x plus 1, and again, if you're having a hard time seeing this, just rewrite this as something like t squared plus 3t plus 1, and See that you can factor this as t plus, oops, I'm sorry, this should be t plus 2, because we just added the two ones. So this should be t plus 2 and t plus 1. Just to double check, this is going to give us 3. Then I have 1t and 2t, which gives me the 3t. So now all I have to do is substitute in what t really is, and I have tan x plus 2 times tan x plus 1. So now I factored that expression. Next, we're going to simplify the expression sine theta divided by 1 plus cosine theta plus cosine theta over sine theta. Now, this is no different than adding any other fractions. We still have to get a common denominator. So our common denominator in this case is actually just going to be the product of the two denominators. <clears throat> Example 6 wants us to rewrite cosine squared of y divided by 1 minus sine of y so that it is not in fractional form. Now, to get rid of a denominator, it's kind of like multiplying by the complex conjugate if you think back to when we were dealing with complex numbers. We're going to do the same thing here. So if I take cosine squared of y and I divide that by 1 minus sine y, and I'm going to multiply this by 1 plus the sine of y divided by 1 plus sine y, now when we multiply by 1 plus sine y divided by 1 plus sine y, this is actually going to give us 1. So I'm not really changing the whole picture. So I'm just going to multiply straight across, and when I do that, I end up with cosine squared y times a quantity of 1 plus sine y divided by now I'm going to multiply, and I see that my middle terms are going to cancel, so I'm left with 1 minus sine squared y. And 1 minus sine squared y is really cosine squared y, so I can actually replace this with cosine squared y. So that will give me cosine squared y times 1 plus sine y 
divided by cosine squared y. And I got cosine squared y because sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. And if you rearrange it, 1 minus sine squared is cosine squared. So now our cosine values are going to cancel and we're left with 1 plus sine y. And we eliminated our fraction by doing this. Example 7 says to use the substitution of x equals 5 sine theta where theta is between 0 and pi over 2 to express the square root of 25 minus x squared. Well, when we do substitution, we are going to do exactly that. So I'm going to take this and plug it in for this value here. When I do that, I have 25 minus 5 sine theta squared. And when I simplify that, that's going to give me the square root of 25 minus 25 sine squared theta. I can factor a 25 out of each piece, which gives me the square root of 25 times 1 minus sine squared theta. And 1 minus sine squared theta, again, is cosine squared. So see how this is important to know sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1? So I can replace 1 minus sine squared with cosine squared. So I have 25 times cosine squared of theta. Well, this is a product, so I can actually separate that out and square root each piece, which is going to give me 5 times the cosine of theta. Once I take that square root, and I am done. And as sad as this may be, example 8 is our last example. And it says to rewrite the natural log of secant theta plus the natural log of cotangent theta as a single log and simplify. Well, if you recall from the properties of logs, when I have a plus in between natural logs or logs, I can actually turn that into a multiplication. So I can rewrite this as the natural log of the absolute value of secant theta times the cotangent of theta. And if I simplify that, secant and cotangent, it doesn't mean anything to me right now, so I'm going to rewrite it in terms of something that does mean something to me. So I'm going to go the natural log of 1 divided by cosine of theta times cotangent is cosine theta divided by sine theta. And I can see right here that cosines are going to cancel. This is going to leave us with the natural log of the absolute value of 1 divided by sine theta, which is really equal to the natural log of the absolute value of 1 divided by sine theta is actually cosecant theta. So this is my simplified log, and that now will con conclude section 5.1. I hope you guys have a great weekend, and I will see you on Monday.